Women have been giving birth for centuries, so it's a pretty natural experience, right? Wrong. I'm Stephanie King, professional doula, childbirth educator, and the creator of the My Essential Birth Course, the online childbirth education course that's helping women everywhere confidently achieve their best birth. Today's culture would have us think that birth should be treated like an illness or an emergency, and that most of us need other people telling us what's best for our bodies because we aren't the experts. So sit tight, because if you're tuning into this podcast, you'll probably start to believe in your body, your intuition, and find yourself empowered and confident to do what it takes to have the birth of your dreams. If you like listening to me take you through these weekly topics step by step, then you're going to love the My Essential Birth course. Make sure that you're subscribed to the podcast and definitely head over to myessentialbirth.com for the free downloads mentioned right here in these episodes and to join the birth course and community full of pregnant moms just like you. I have to add a disclaimer that I am not a medical professional and I cannot provide medical advice. All of the information expressed in this podcast are based off of personal, professional, and educational experiences and are my own opinions. Please work with a provider you trust for medical advice during your pregnancy and birth. Okay, this week's interviewer of the week is 63747MM. And I feel like that might be secret code for something and I don't know what it is. So don't judge me on that one. But they said, totally fell in love with the information and the fact that these ladies are evidence-based and do their absolute best to give both sides of the story. I'm so grateful I found this podcast and it has made me feel so much more confident in my pregnancy and birth. That's the goal. So thank you for the review. And I'm super glad that's exactly what it's doing for you. I bet you anything today's episode is going to do the exact same thing. So this topic is so good because it's really one of the things that are immediately on the forefront of our minds, I think, as soon as we have our babies. And as I was talking with our guest here before, I said, I think I do a really excellent job of preparing my moms for birth, for pregnancy, and um, but getting them to the other side. And like, seriously, I just feel like this is the number one thing that they're dealing with after having a baby. Of course, you're taking care of yourself postpartum, but your job is to now keep another child alive, <laughs> keep another human alive. And so breastfeeding kind of leads into that. And I think too, if you're choosing to breastfeed, I think often those first few days specifically are such a blur and it may or may not come naturally for you. It's a blessing and a wonderful thing when things just are so smooth and it feels like water, right? But when it doesn't, we we don't, I don't know, there's resources that you guys can have and things that you can do that can help that go a little more smoothly. So I definitely want to jump in a little bit about that today. But I think there's things like you're worried about is baby getting enough milk? Uh Am I breastfeeding long enough during a nursing session? Is this what's happening to my nipple? Is this normal? Is it supposed to feel that way? Did I do I have to empty the whole breast? There's all these these ideas and stuff that we have to deal with postpartum. Um, And just the like what's normal and what's not. Uh So today we get to explore some of these things a little deeper and hopefully give you an episode that you can download and have on hand with you for right after baby's born. And so today's topic is all about those first 48 hours. Um, And we've agreed to completely go off topic and just talk about whatever we choose to talk about as well. (laughs) So that's how I'm going to introduce it and we'll see how it goes. Um, But I want to take a moment and introduce you to Sally. So I have with me here Sally Wright. She is an international board certified lactation consultant. We're going to talk about why IBCLC matters. Those letters matter. You have a couple of other letters. (laughs) Tell me what the other ones are for and then I will Um, finish that bio. Well, so RLC is a registered lactation consultant. Okay. So an IBCLC is the only credential that is supposed to use the the designation of lactation consultant. There, it's I conf- didn't know that. The alphabet soup can be confusing because you may see CLC or CLEC. These are certified lactation counselors, certified lactation educator counselors. These are people who have taken a course that qualifies them to teach a breastfeeding class, but not necessarily to provide clinical care. Um, those, those courses can be a step on the way to um, certifying as an IBCLC, but an IBCLC is your only lactation consultant. I love that. I didn't even know that. I feel like I've been in the birth world a long time and I should know that. <laughs> well, and people, people are pretty casual about using all kinds of terminology like lactation specialist or lactation nurse or my, my breastfeeding nurse, my breastfeeding helper. I like to point out that lactation specialist is not a credential Anyone who's ever lactated is a lactation specialist. <laughs> I like that. That's, I mean, it's, I've, it's, e- I've even seen in the hospitals here in Utah the badge, and it says lactation consultant. 
Like I and they may in fact thought. be an IBCLC and designated I, as that. Because again, I, I fully acknowledge that the alphabet soup gets confusing for yeah. people, but there is a difference. Okay. There's a significant difference in how many hours we put into our training. I literally only think about human lactation <laughs> and maybe what's for dinner. I love it. So if that's, I mean, so, and I recognize too that not everybody wants to only think about human yeah, lactation. Right. <laughs> so if you have questions about it, call the person who only thinks about that. I love it. Okay, so call Sally. <laughs> um, okay, so let me introduce her just a moment here. But Sally grew up in Hawaii. She now lives in Utah. So we are lucky to have her here with us. If you're in Utah, you're lucky too. She's the mother of five children, including a set of girl boy twins. She has been an IBCLC in 2016 and has served as a volunteer leader since 2006 with La Leche League, providing community breastfeeding support. Sally especially loves helping parents of multiples meet the joys and challenges of a life with abundance. When she's not working with nursing families and not thinking about lactation, <laughs> Sally is driving her kids around to basketball and skating or playing with her dogs. Mother Fed, their office is in downtown Salt Lake City with free, easy parking, as she states here. Sally shares a collaborative practice with three other experienced IBCLCs and has an immense personal and professional respect for her colleagues. So I will definitely, at the end of our session here, I'll make sure to list everywhere that you can find her. It'll be in the show notes. If you get the weekly email from us, that it's going to be in there as well. So welcome, Sally. Thanks. Thank you for Thanks being for here. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here with you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So let's talk about those first 48 hours. Okay. Um, um, I thought we could kind of split it into two categories, sure. kind of the, the breasts and the baby, because sure. those are the two things that came to my mind. Um, but maybe we'll start with the breasts. What happens to them after our baby is born? So your breasts have been undergoing a transition even during pregnancy. Around In the third trimester of pregnancy, there's enough of a hormonal shift going on that your breasts may start to produce some colostrum. Having only a little bit or noticing some dripping colostrum, both of those, there's a wide range of normal, but you may notice that transition. Um, colostrum is the fluid that the body produces before mature milk. It is highly concentrated in antibodies and it can be a sign that your body's gearing up for birth and getting ready to feed baby. Um, when baby is born, it's actually the removal of the placenta that triggers the onset of lactation. Um, and that, that's actually key. We, we tend to think that, it, that the removal of the baby is what tells the body to start with lactation, but it's the removal of the placenta. And biologically, this makes sense to me because it's like telling the body, we don't need this gear anymore to feed the baby. Mm. We're going to activate the other system. And the placenta is very hormonally active. So all of it needs to be removed for the onset of lactation to start. When occasionally when people hit a complication where they feel like, oh, well, my milk isn't coming in, my milk just didn't come in, I'm a week postpartum and my milk hasn't come in, the most likely scenario there is that there is a fragment of placenta left in the uterus that is interfering with that hormonal transition from pregnancy to birth. And the body is stuck in limbo saying, which way am I feeding the baby? I don't even know. Wow, um, I didn't know that. That, that a, a little piece of retained placental fragment can absolutely interfere with the onset of lactation. That's crazy interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Literally did not know that. Right, and so that's why, like, that's why it's important. And it can be tricky to, to campaign a little bit to your doctor or midwife to say, please rule this out with ultrasound because I'm on day six and I'm only getting a drop of milk. Um, this, that's not the range of normal. The onset of lactation we typically see mature milk starting on day three or four. Um, occasionally later, especially if there was a lot of blood loss or a cesarean birth, but, um, but if you're really not having the onset of lactation by day five or six, it's time to start asking some questions. And a little piece of retained placenta can be easily ruled out with an ultrasound. Yeah, that's great. So are there, mm -hmm. it makes me wonder if there are other things then, like is it mental health or like, like stress or hormones that wouldn't be involved with retained placenta that can cause that issue say if that you're ruling again. that out. So <clears throat> yeah, so if we do rule it out and we say it's not retained placenta and it's been a week and mom isn't lactating, mm. what are you seeing the other causes So we be? would start to look for other physical markers of um, how much glandular tissue is, does this person have. And there are some physical markers for what is clinically known as insufficient glandular tissue, IGT. It's kind of an unfortunate term because I am always reminding my clients that you are enough and you have enough of everything you need to care for your baby. But there are varying amounts of glandular tissue in people. 
and even from breast to breast. And there are a few physical markers that people can be aware of during their pregnancy and as they start lactating that can tip us off that there might not be enough glandular tissue to produce a full milk supply. Now that doesn't mean you can't breastfeed your baby and nurse your baby and enjoy your baby in every way. Um, but it means that you'll want to be working with a very experienced IBCLC who can help maximize your milk production. I like that. And I agree with the one producing more than the other, right? Yes. Totally <laughs> yes. range of normal. Before I had twins, I used to say that breasts are sisters, not twins. And now that I know <laughs> just how different twins are, I'm like, breasts are just different, just yeah. like twins. <laughs> I love that. Um, okay. And I love that you talked about this too, we, I, the placenta and all of that, because I know that I teach, right? After a baby is born, you want to mm -hmm. get them as quick as you can, skin mm -hmm. to skin and close to your breasts so that they can nozzle the breast because what it does is it creates oxytocin. It helps yes. our body create oxytocin. Um, oxytocin is that love hormone. <clears throat> it does a couple of things. It helps us bond with our baby. It also helps us release the placenta. It gives us contractions and that helps our bodies to expel and deliver that placenta. I did not know. Like I, I am like tripping out on that, that fact. I love that. I love knowing that now. Um, so it's really encouraging. Like it's a really healthy, good, positive thing to have your baby close to you right away. Um, I think too, I wanted to move into like the, you, the nuzzling and snuggling. Right. But then how quickly are you supposed to have baby latched on after it's like immediate skin to skin? Do they have to be nursing right away? What is the recommendation for that? Not necessarily. And I recognize there's all kinds of variables in how your birth goes, but if you can have baby skin to skin immediately after birth, baby should be latched within an hour, that golden hour. You'd like to be able to have baby connect with the breast and for the nursing parent to feel some success pretty early on. Birth is exhausting. Birth is athletic. And so it's totally normal that after birth, we're, you know, we're exultant. We're at the top of the mountain peak, but shortly after we're all going to crash and need a long nap, like need a big sandwich and a long nap. <laughs> and babies are no different. They've been working hard too. So if we can, if we can have a, a positive breastfeeding experience in that first golden hour, then we've got some good things kind of solidified and moving forward in baby's mind and physiology and we can have that long stretch of sleep after where everybody's feeling cuddly but then moving into the next feedings we can feel like oh we've done this we know how to do this we had a we got a good start yeah do you feel like um i've been at a couple births where baby's pretty tired mm -hmm. and so and i mean they will kind of unswaddle them and things do you have recommendations for moms to yeah like, unswaddle them yeah <laughs> that's that's a really Get good them cold one. wake them up <laughs> yeah well i'm not trying to make babies cold and miserable no but first. swaddling absolutely the reason it's be, it's so frequently used in hospitals as as a tool for taking care of babies is because it literally shuts them down okay. it, it is turning off a baby okay and <laughs> We don't want to turn them off when we're trying hard to connect with what their feeding signals are. And we're learning how to feed. We're both learning how to feed. Both the yeah. new, this new parent and this new baby are both figuring out how does this new system work and how are we going to work on it together. And if they're swaddled up with no ability to give us any signals, they will, they'll shut, withdraw and shut down. Um, instead of giving us the feeding cues that we need to learn to respond to. Okay, love it. Um, let's take a moment and talk about colostrum. Mm -hmm. um, I think especially... I love colostrum. <laughs> <laughs> they call it liquid gold, right? Yeah. Uh, if a mom, for whatever reason, maybe something happened with baby, they can't do immediate skin to skin, mm -hmm. a little more serious with mom. Um, this is a question I get a lot, and I, I, as, I don't want to say anything rude here, but I think as helpful as some hospitals try to be postpartum, sometimes they make it a little bit difficult for mom to get baby the colostrum that they need. Uh -huh. So what's the recommendation if mom's choosing to breastfeed, she would like preferably for them not to have anything except for breast milk uh -huh. postpartum, and there's benefits to that as well. Uh -huh. What's the recommendation for mom? For if, if she, so she hits complications and can't directly breastfeed her baby, and she's worried about making sure that her baby receives her colostrum. Right. So a clean spoon is a very ordinary piece of equipment that everybody has that can be useful in this kind of situation. I really like the spoon because it's common, it's easy to get, and it reinforces the idea that colostrum is produced in small amounts. Yeah. We're not looking for buckets and buckets. And if you're, if you're immediately postpartum and you're trying to hand express a little bit of colostrum into a collection container 
that you know into a right. four ounce collection container <laughs> you'll i mean you'll look down into the <laughs> container and think why am i even bothering and yeah. that's because the container is what's not normal here a spoon reinforces that we're only meant to have a little spoonful at a time this stuff is loaded with antibodies this is baby's first a lot of people refer to it as like baby's first vaccine this is baby's first opportunity to be um have their their guts coated with everything they need to establish normal gut flora too um you can hand express into a spoon and then t and t talk to your hospital staff if you're giving birth at a hospital say i i would really like to hand express some colostrum and have it in a syringe they should be able to provide you with a sterile syringe and a clean spoon these are very ordinary pieces of equipment really for anybody but particularly in a hospital setting any nurse should be able to put their hands on those in seconds um, hand express into a spoon suck up that colostrum into a small syringe and that's what you can use to offer the baby to help keep blood sugar stable and help mom recover from birth and help establish, help with the onset of lactation. Are there any recommendations? I think of moms that are like, oh no, I know from the beginning, I'm not interested in breastfeeding. Are there any recommendations um, for those who do choose to formula feed or feed the baby in a different way that like, um, if you'd like to, you could still at least do the colostrum. It's yeah, like for sure. these benefits and then move on to the, for sure. to the other things. We, and at MotherFed, our IBCLCs don't even talk about benefits of breastfeeding because we just look at breastfeeding as normal infant feeding. This is the biological norm. Um, and of course, we have to reach outside of the biological norm when we hit speed bumps and trouble. Yeah. Um, but generally, we're talking about reinforcing what's normal. Um, we have we actually carry at MotherFed colostrum collection kits for people who are leaking a little bit of colostrum as they approach mm. birth, and so you can collect it prenatally. Um, there's there's some information online. People pass around scary stories in mom forums about how you know any breast stimulation will lead to preterm labor. No, not, <laughs> not really. If you're not on pelvic rest, then yeah. then it's it's appropriate and safe to be hand expressing some colostrum. I was going to say, I know many moms that wish it would, you know, right. <laughs> it's harder to get it to right. create contractions. Right. <laughs> yeah. right. Yeah. Um, and you're, we're not talking about lots and lots of pumping either. We're talking about hand expressing a spoonful of colostrum at a time. And you can use a collection kit to harvest that before, even before you give birth. If for someone who does not is not interested in sustaining their lactation journey, there's still, because of the hormonal shift, it's unavoidable that there will be some colostrum produced and mm -hmm. that shift to mature milk. And it will be a short-lived experience, but it can be really uncomfortable if you don't address it. And as long as you aren't getting out of that part at all, why not offer it to your baby to maintain stable blood sugar, help normalize that gut flora? There's, there's no wrong answer there. Yeah, I like that a lot. Um, I did have some questions that I got from moms when I pulled them online. Just what do you want to know from an oh, IBCLC? Good. Yeah. And a couple of these, I thought maybe it doesn't come up within the first 48 hours. Some of them might, but certainly within the first week or so. Mm -hmm. And that's like, what do you do when you've got something like a clogged duct? Or, mm. And how do you tell if that's a clogged duct versus a lymph node or mastitis comes on or um, they're pumping and not getting much? And is it a supply issue? Is it normal? Just some of these like kind of random thoughts. Of, sure. Yeah. What, yeah. These what are, are all really good that? thoughts. If you're pumping and not getting very much, question your pump before you question your body. Okay. Um, I like it. <laughs> do, you have an, like, do you have an awesome pump or do you have um, the, the lowest level pump that your insurance company would cover? Mm. Um, that's a good question to ask because there is, there, there is a difference. There's a, a wide range in what, in the quality of a pump. Do you have some recommendations? It totally. So the, a recommendation for pumping depends on somebody's needs. Okay. Are they exclusively pumping for a baby who's sick in the NICU? Um, are they, do they just need, do they need to pump because they're headed back to full-time employment and they're going to be pumping still like seven or eight times a day? Um, are they pumping twice a month for a date night? Um, Got it. These are, yeah. like, there's a, there's a wide variety. But if someone's hit trouble and then we are talking about a hospital grade, a clinical grade single pump, and of course you're, it won't be a single user pump. It'll be, it'll, it'll look like a tank. Like it'll okay. be a, <laughs> a big heavy thing. Okay. Um, and a, a hospital grade rental pump is absolutely worth the expense if you're trying to use a pump to establish lactation. 
And the, the primary difference is the power of the motor okay. and, and the range of um, modes. We, oh, I, I, I joke with clients all the time that like both a Porsche and a beater will get you to work. Right. But the, but the beater has to work harder. <laughs> yeah. And if you're, if you're already stressed in other ways, then maybe it's time to rent the Porsche pump um, to get you through. But even if you have a pump that generally works for you and then suddenly you see a shift, you're like, oh, it's not working anymore. Oh, no. Mm. Um, it's easy to hit the panic button and think that there's something inadequate about your body and that is usually not the case. We're, we're absolutely conditioned to assume something's wrong with our body, but that's usually not the case. Check your flanges, check your little membranes, check the duckbill part, like tr- start troubleshooting that pump and see if there's any holes or dirty spots or loose spots. Um, look at your gear first. If you're not responding to the pump at all, there's some different strategies you can try too. Um, gentle breast massage before pumping, um, a standard suggestion is to have a picture of your baby or even to record your baby fussing on your phone so that if you're That's at work smart. and you're trying to have a letdown, <laughs> yeah, that'll do it. Um, in my own season, I can remember like being at the grocery store and somebody else's baby would cry and I'd be like, <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, clean up on aisle two. I got to go home. <laughs> Um, because breastfeeding is physical and also psychological too. Yeah. Acknowledging that. There was another question that you, that you mentioned just then. Let's see. There clogged was a, ducts. Oh, clogged ducts and lymph nodes. Yeah. yeah. So your lymph, you ha- everyone has some lymph nodes in their armpits and breast tissue does extend into the armpit. So that could be, there could be an overlap there where you're like, I don't know what this is. There's a lump and it could be anything. Yeah. Um, the difference is how crappy do you feel? If you just have one isolated sore spot, that is likely to be a plug duct. I think of it as like butter that got congealed in a little tube. We got to melt that butter and get things moving again um, so that it's not stuck there in a little clump. If it's stuck there very long, then you have milk stasis with milk building up behind it and the potential for inf- bacteria to grow and infection to set in. And that can lead to mastitis and that's unpleasant. With a swollen lymph node, I would suspect other symptoms. If you feel crappy all over, you know, I've okay. got a sore throat and a fever and a cough and, and now also a lump in my armpit. I'm like, well, you might just be sick all over. Yeah. Um, there's no reason to stop breastfeeding or pumping when you're sick. You might need extra help to do it. You might need someone to help you care for your baby. Um, but there's nothing, your milk is perfect always. I, and, I needed to know that as first time mom because I really freaked out the first time I was sick. I was like, oh my gosh, I don't want to get my baby sick. Absolutely. Yeah. It's easy to feel like, oh no, I'm germy. I can't give my baby yeah. germy milk. It's actually the opposite. I'm germy. And so my body's working overtime to load up my milk with the antibodies for these specific germs to make sure my baby doesn't get what I've got. Yeah. No, so that was awesome advice. <laughs> we don't want to interrupt normal feeding even when mom is feeling terrible, even when she's sick. She might need extra help with everything else, yeah. but let's not interrupt the feeding unless yeah. we have to. I'm glad you mentioned that. I didn't have that as a question, so I appreciate it. Um, okay. Oh, well, how about how to relieve a clogged duct? Yeah. So I, the number one thing that I see people trying to do that they might be a little too vigorous on is trying to massage out a clogged duct. Yes. Good thinking, but go (laughs) easy because your breast tissue is not like muscle tissue. This is not like a knot in your muscle after you've worked out hard. Mm. This, your tissue is delicate and you can bruise yourself and then be miserable in two directions (laughs) later. So I may have done this. Right. (laughs) Well, and especially the desperation of a clogged duct, you're like, it hurts so much. I just want to squish it right out. Right. Um, But you got to be gentle with yourself. The, the basic protocol for both a plug duct and ma- the mastitis that it could lead to is heat, rest, and empty breast. So applying some warm, moist heat, it could be a shower, it could be a wet washcloth, it could be a hot microwaved rice bag, um, your choice, but just something toasty on that, on that breast to give it some heat. I always think of it again as like we're trying to melt some butter and get things mm-hmm. moving through the pipes again. And then rest is key. People are like, yeah, yeah, rest. I only did 100 things today instead right. of, yeah. <laughs> but the rest is actually key because you, need, okay. you want your body's energy to focus on recovering from that and make sure that infection is not setting in. An empty breast 
just means keep milk moving. This is not a time to discontinue breastfeeding. This is not a time to reduce pumping. In fact, some people find adding in a session of pumping mm -hmm. or even just gentle hand expression can help make sure that milk is moving from all the ducts. And as that plug loosens, then everything can come out. Yeah. Okay. I had heard something. You tell me if this is accurate. It did work for me. Okay. I had well, heard, if it worked for you, then it probably... Then it works. Yeah. <laughs> but I was told... Um, <clears throat> Wherever the clogged duct is, mm -hmm. you guys can't see me. Those are listening on the podcast. I'm pointing to my boobs. Yes. Um, wherever, whichever side the clogged duct is on, to put your baby's chin nursing closest to it. And so I would literally, when and I would get a decent amount of clogged ducts, I would lay my baby on the bed and turn them whichever direction I needed and then put my boob in their right. mouth so that they could, because I was told that they, they nurse the strongest from mm -hmm. down here, that that's where that, the strongest suck is coming from. And that did work for me. So I was curious Good. if that's something that you so, use. Yeah, what you've described is called dangle feeding. Okay. Where, yeah. And it's not it's nobody's most glamorous or dignified moment, but it, when, it works. when you're uncomfortable, you'll, you'll do what works. Yep. Um, it is allowing gravity to be your friend and help because you're Makes leaning sense. over yes. your baby on a bed. Um, and yes, you're right. The, the motor of breastfeeding is baby's tongue. Okay. And so we want to focus that. It's not, it's not a hard and fast rule, okay. but, but just the general idea of changing positioning around. Because if you've, like clogged ducts often happen when, um, when you're going a slightly longer amount of time between nursing sessions or you're very busy and you're doing something. Um, my, I, I'm being vague, but what I'm thinking of is Christmas time. Christmas time mm. is like plug duck season for me. Is it? <laughs> yeah. I could see that. But that's because starting at Thanksgiving, people are getting together with their families and they're passing their babies around. So baby's mm. not complaining or having lots of feeding cues because oh. baby's being passed around to enthusiastic people who will hold and bounce and rock and walk. And, but then that means that the nursing parent is going longer stretches without feeding and also being extra busy. Maybe she's right-handed and she's always doing everything right-handed. She's decorating the Christmas tree. She's frosting cookies. She's driving the car. She's doing everything with her right hand. So she's only nursing on the left. Well, mm -hmm. a couple days of that will give you a plug duct on the right. So that's where the rest comes in. Like rest, Got change it. positions, make sure your baby has a chance to move milk effectively through both breasts in every way. Got it. Okay. I love it. All right. Let's move on to the baby. First 48. Does, and we kind of talked about this. So does baby need to nurse right away? It sounded like if you can do that within the first hour. Ideally, yeah. Yeah. And it doesn't, and I want to emphasize too that in our practice, we meet people where they're at. We recognize that stuff happens and sometimes babies show up way too early and they can't nurse from the get-go. Like not everybody gets that perfect golden hour. Sometimes things are happening that need to be managed and they are the very most pressing things. Whatever you are dealing with, that's, it's okay. We can take it from there. But if you have the option of having everything smooth and going your way, then getting a nursing session in in the first hour is ideal. Love it. Um, another question I know is going to come up is how often should baby nurse? And along with that, should you wake your sleeping baby? <laughs> because right. I know as a new mom, I'm like, mm. you don't even want to say it out loud. Nope. Like, <laughs> yeah. Whisper that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, it's an excellent question. I think that some people fall into the idea, especially especially high achieving parents who want things to do. They want to do everything right. They want to do things in an order, um, and it can get a little bit regimented, which it doesn't necessarily have to be. But it's easy to look for answers that are very hard and fast. One thing that I see quite often is people assuming that, especially if their baby did some time in the NICU, that a three hour schedule is ideal. I want to reinforce the idea that babies need to eat more often than that because nursing every three hours is only eight nursing sessions in a 24 hour period. You want to aim for at least 10, at least 10, 10, 12, 14. These are all solid range of normal amounts for number of times babies nurse in 24 hours. The three hour schedule is popularized in the hospital. Mm -hmm. But consider that it is not based on biology. It is based on the 12-hour shifts of hospital staff. Got it. Those nurses need to make sure that all babies are fed, cared for, and charted before they change over staff every 12 hours. 
So three divides evenly by 12, and this is a logical thing for them to do. When you and your baby are at home, you have a superior caregiver to baby ratio, even if you have twins or triplets. <laughs> um, and you can customize your responsiveness to your baby a little bit more than that. Feeding on cue, especially in those first three to six weeks, is vital for establishing lactation well and also keeping blood sugar steady and promoting weight gain and just in general becoming more confident at responding to your baby's cues. So for those, that brought up a question for me because you said a minimum, right, of 10 Mm -hmm. within the first 24 hours or within 24 hours. How long do you hold on to that? before you can and maybe some of that is like the natural progression of it right but how do you know when it's like oh they they're not nursing enough or they are nursing enough and when when does that change um it doesn't necessarily have to change for many many months okay um and and if you want it to change if you want it to change absolutely (laughs) okay because there's i recognize that there's the biological norm and then there's the reality of life yeah um, and people are headed back to employment or, or their education. Like people have lots of things going on. So the answer to that will vary depending on the circumstances of, of each individual family. Okay. But I would say you're aiming for at least 10 sessions, at least for the first six weeks. We define the postpartum period as that first six weeks from mm-hmm. birth or from term if your baby shows up early. So if your baby shows up early, give them some extra time. First six weeks from term dates. Um, so that they are getting plenty of milk. Small frequent feedings are the biological norm, and it keeps us out of so much trouble when it comes to things like low blood sugar or low milk supply or slow weight gain. All of those things can be avoided with small frequent feedings from the get-go. And that tapers off, that, that easily tapers off after the first couple of months if you need it to, if you're making adjustments in other ways. Um, but yeah. Okay. That makes sense. So we talked about, we whispered it, right? So, oh, should you wake do a you have baby? to? Should you wake a sleeping baby? <laughs> like when you're saying 10 nursing sessions in 24 hours, <clears throat> could my baby have a five hour stretch and I still end up having yes. 10 nursing sessions yes. that's safe? Okay. Yes. So if we're talking about a healthy full term baby with no, that's not medically fragile, no complicated health variables there. So if you, if you're listening to this and you are in a different situation, just just know that you can consult your own providers to make a proper care plan for your baby. But if we're talking about a healthy full-term baby, for the first six weeks, it is safe and appropriate for a baby to have one four to six hour stretch of sleep per 24 hours. So, and also you can have more sleep. There will be more sleep in your life than that. Yeah. But that's, we just wanna have one only one long stretch, only one four to six hour stretch of sleep per 24 hours for the first six weeks. And then the reason is small frequent feedings are the biological norm. We're trying to establish lactation. We are riding a beautiful cushion of hormones postpartum that helps us establish that lactation and frequent milk removal can help us best take advantage of that to help our bodies stay sensitive to the prolactin hormones that will set up our lactation great, like give us a great milk supply and help baby really thrive. After six weeks, baby can go longer, baby can have multiple long stretches, but for those first six weeks, if baby has already had one long stretch of sleep that lasted four to six hours, and then that's, there's a second nap that's crossing that three hour mark, it actually is time to wake baby to feed. Okay. If we don't and we have multiple long stretches of sleep, we just simply run out of waking hours to get in lots of feedings. And that's where we hit things like slow weight gain, dropped milk supply, other concerns like that. Okay. Sorry, brought up another question. Yeah. So now I'm wondering, like, what if you have a baby that seriously is maybe not sleeping well and also wants to be nursing all the time? Maybe we call it colicky or whatever, but we have a baby that's just like, oh my gosh, like I need a break as a mom. Right. But is that, can that just be normal kind of biological norm? Is there something else there? Yes. So there's a line there's and that is this is actually a really good time to be in touch with an experienced ibclc okay um because it is absolutely true that babies need to nurse frequently small frequent feedings are the biological norm and help establish your breastfeeding journey if it is relentless 
And, and cluster, I should say, cluster feeding is also a norm, particularly in the evenings. That is normal and healthy for babies to want to nurse frequently, extra frequently in those evening hours. They're tanking up on calories so that they can have that longer stretch of sleep. So even if your baby seems especially needy in those evening hours, try to reframe it in your mind and say, it's okay because this means that they're understanding that nighttime is when we tank up and have a longer stretch. Like that's, it's a positive thing. It's a, a positive developmental thing. Um, if your baby is either nursing or crying and we don't have any quiet alert time and everybody is sad and feeling <laughs> spread very thin and a little frayed, um, it's time to reach out for some help. Um, there may be other signs too. There may be, you know, a uh, slowed stool pattern or slowed weight gain. These other things that can tip you off like, okay, I think we're having, we're having some trouble. We're, I'm trying to be responsive. I'm trying to nurse as much as I can. But if my, if my suggestions of a normal range of that like 10 to 14-ish times per 24 hours of nursing sessions, if that seems like dramatically low I, and you want to say, how many times am I nursing in a day? Like, I don't know, 10 million? Like, am I ever not yeah. nursing? That's, it's time to ask some questions and troubleshoot because it's high effort for everyone. It's, high, it's taxing for, for mom. Um, and it's high effort for baby, and we want to make sure that baby's getting what they need and that mom feels like things are moving forward properly instead of just making her tread water. Yeah. Well, and I'm glad I have you here, too, because I I have seen, like, the recommendation, like, oh, colicky baby, like, get him to a chiropractor and get him to this and that, but part of the colicky is, like, nursing all day, and so I, I really feel like an IBCLC is the first stop. I'm curious to know if that's you're nodding your head yes. yeah so like yeah <laughs> so if there are other things right like right chiropractor or whatever come to you and then you can say yeah maybe baby needs an adjustment or maybe this or that right right, right. we can see we can we note things all the time some yeah. asymmetry some muscle tension um lots of positioning things um very famously many years ago my my colleague um said gently to a client what happens if you don't hold your baby upside down? Let's try to move them in this way. And you know, lo and behold, it made a really big difference for that parent's breastfeeding journey. Um, positioning adjustments can, even slight ones can make a big difference. We troubleshoot everything. Okay. But I really think that sometimes people are spending a lot of money and a lot of energy driving around to appointments for with every other specialist. Right. They're like, oh, I'm having breastfeeding problems. Who shall I call? Well, I'll start with the plumber, and then <laughs> and then I'll consult with the pool boy, and then if that doesn't work, and everyone has their expertise. And we we as an experienced IBCLC, we frequently refer to and collaborate care with other specialists. Absolutely. But if you have an infant feeding question, an IBCLC is literally the infant feeding specialist, and that's who you can start with. And maybe your perceived problem isn't your problem at all. Hmm. We might see more things than, than you may know to look at. Yeah. Well, and especially being postpartum as a mom, you know, there's enough going on in our heads that right. it's, it's exhausting. nice to have somebody else see it. It's for exhausting. Us. I, yeah. I have had many clients come in when they fill out their medical questionnaire. One of the reasons for their, their stated concern for making an appointment was perceived low milk supply. And that was not what was going on. That was, we had, we had other things to worry about, but, and they were relieved, frankly, to say, look, sure. I'm not concerned about your supply. That's not, you have milk everywhere, buckets of milk. The milk is not the problem. You're doing awesome. Let's troubleshoot these other aspects of, of your breastfeeding relationship. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, for those of you that are listening, I maybe you haven't even heard of an IBCLC before, and that's why I love having Sally here. Because as we were talking even before the episode, I said, you know, the problem is I think that women don't even know you exist. Right. Right? Like, even when, like, they're looking for help and, oh, well, I'll go to my pediatrician because they take care of right. babies. And But the thing about pediatricians is not only are they not lactation consultants, but, like, they don't have a ton of training in no. even what to do. And what's frustrating is I find the majority of them are not referring people to IBCLCs either. So then it's just another gap that's happening. Formula gets introduced, that kind of thing. 
And so I I love that we get to have this conversation today and that people get to hear about these letters, right? Yeah. <laughs> and we talk about this and make it a little more normal. And so I love too that we're talking about your first stop. This is the person that can help you the most mm-hmm. after having your baby with feeding issues, feeding your baby, making sure that they're healthy and well is an IBCLC. So I just wanted to kind of put that on repeat there to Absolutely. make sure that women are hearing that. Absolutely. And pediatricians, even if, even if they did take lactation courses, which are electives in medical school, even if they did manage to focus on on childhood nutrition and take a class in in lactation, they simply don't have the time in their practice to troubleshoot thoroughly. Um, An appointment at MotherFed lasts almost two hours, like around that. We're we're working hard to make sure that we're very, very thorough um, and looking at every aspect of the infant feeding relationship. Um, Pediatricians don't have that time in their schedule. Even if they had the, the training they can't do that. Right. Um, we actually have pediatricians as our clients sometimes. <laughs> I love it. I love that. They want I love co- that they know. <laughs> they want to collaborate and and work with us to make sure that they're on the right track. They value normal infant feeding and they want to maximize that even with their very busy and complicated schedules. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Something that comes up, I know a lot too. So we've had our baby. We want to make sure that they're getting enough. Something that we've heard is like how many wet diapers per day, how many, you know, poopy diapers Mm -hmm. per day. And I know you and I talk about this within the birth course and we've had this conversation before too, but not just that. I want you to talk about input and output because I have heard, and I had it with my own babies too, where like, I have been nursing for five days and my baby hasn't pooped and the what the information that I'm getting back from other people is like well they just um they just use all up the they use up all those nutrients that you've given them so they don't have to poop for five days and like as a person that eats food and goes to the bathroom it doesn't sound right (laughs) it's because it's not yeah (laughs) it's it comes from such a well-meaning place um yeah there's there's an attitude of positivity around the concept of breastfeeding. And I think sometimes we want to make breastfeeding and human milk magical. (laughs) And well, I I mean, I, (laughs) I think it's awesome, but, but I, I'm also very interested in, in actual data and not waving away things as, as merely magical. Um, human. So let's see how to focus. (laughs) I I, throw a lot at you. No, I actually get really excited about this topic um, because it's a common one. It's a, it's a way for people who are really excited and positive and have a positive attitude about their breastfeeding journey to get derailed and get into trouble without even realizing it. We talk a lot about output, both urine output and stool output. Stool output is the one to watch. Stool output is the, is the, the canary in the coal mine that tells you when things are going awesome or when maybe something needs an, a little bit more attention. Okay. Immediately postpartum, you're looking for the n- same number of stools as the number of days baby is old. So one poop on day one, two on day two, and so on until day five. Starting on day five, for at least the first six weeks postpartum, you're looking for five stools per 24 hours. And they don't have to be enormous diaper blowouts. Anything the size of a U.S. quarter or bigger counts as a stool. Okay. And sometimes we joke a little bit like, well, it's day seven and this baby only pooped once, but it was 350 and change. And so <laughs> that, that, I would say that that still counts in the range of normal. Okay. But what's typical and ideal is at least five stools per 24 hours for the first six weeks postpartum. The reason for this is that a lot of the components of human milk are not digestible by the baby at all. They're not not designed to be digested by the baby. Um, A lot of it it functions as fertilizer for the the beneficial bacteria in baby's gut and helps normalize gut flora. There's, I mean, there's just so much cool stuff in human milk. Lactoferrin is a component of human milk that kind of... um, tricks pathogens into thinking that it's iron so pathogens will latch onto it and then the lactoferrin comes out with the stools and so it helps your babies flush out any pathogens that would be trying to make them sick wow Um, it's really really cool stuff we don't want everything to stay in the baby we want the system to work and i'm fond of saying as you allude to and we've talked about before there's there's input and there's output and with good input we also see good output I, I know that some people comment a lot about um, wet diapers and urine output. Um, 
particularly as adults, we always want to stay well hydrated and note mm-hmm. that we're having good urine output. But for a baby, a tiny baby, you know, we're talking about an eight pound person. By the time a baby has slowed urine output, that's a medical emergency. Yeah. They're dangerously dehydrated. Watching for stool output can give you a little bit of warning because that's not a medical emergency at first. That tips you off, hey, it's been a day since this baby pooped. I'm just going to sit on the sofa and nurse today and see if that helps. I'm going to give this baby a lot more input and see if that leads to more output. So we know that the whole system is working properly. And if it doesn't, I think I'll call my IBCLC yeah. and troubleshoot because what's up? So that leads me to another question. Mm-hmm. I actually did have, as a doula, I had a mom who she, it had been about 24 hours, you know, as a doula, I come back and check right. shortly after and how's mom doing? How's baby doing? And she's like, ah, oh, my baby really hasn't like we haven't had any wet diapers and she showed me the latch looked good from what I could see but I'm not a lactation consultant so I was like well baby's latching and they're sucking but I am noticing that there's no milk at the corner and baby was really lethargic they're like yeah they're like really not awake and stuff they had had like no diapers Mm -hmm. and I'm like and for me I'm like okay that's like and she said I think we had some frozen milk in our shit but I don't want to just get the the stored stuff and I'm like no get the stored stuff like I know enough to say like you have to feed the baby you got to figure that out also what's the next step right so I said IBCLC you're saying medical emergency for medical emergency where it's like oh dang there's something very serious Mm -hmm. here is it IBCLC time for the ER okay um because we have to we have to rehydrate this tiny little person yeah um and and however we do I mean there's lots of ways to do that but we may be and everything depends on timing there but sure but if we're talking about a baby who has no urine output and is lethargic we just don't have a lot of time when we're talking about a tiny person yeah we don't want to be casual because if there is something really awful going on an infection or a heart problem that's causing the lethargy we we need medical eyes on that okay absolutely yeah it was such a crazy I just, I knew enough that like, no, that's not normal. Absolutely. Please find help. The number one rule is always feed the baby. Right. We're never, ever talking about feeding the baby versus not feeding the baby. Right. That's, that's never, ever the discussion. The number one rule is always feed the baby. And the number two rule is to protect milk supply. Yeah. So in that situation, it sounds like she was concerned. There may have been milk supply issues. There may have been transfer concerns. Maybe she had milk, but we, but baby wasn't able to move that milk. We have to feed the baby because a well-fed baby will always be more vigorous yeah. at learning how to feed. Yeah. Any way we feed the baby. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we need to get that baby fed, stabilized and fed and see what, then see what's next. Okay. Then we can start troubleshooting. Yeah. And for those listening, mom and baby were fine. Like, oh, great. They, <laughs> oh, great. Because I, I was well. like, no. Oh, no, no, they really were fine. And same thing. They went to the hospital and stuff, but mm-hmm. I said also, you know, make sure that you're, you're contacting yeah. the IBCLC. Um, she did get with one and I don't remember what the issue was. I just remember if mom and baby were fine and that was good, but I good. figured I'd finish that story. Good. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Other questions that come up kind of what if I want to introduce a bottle and or binky how quickly can I do that um and then burping my baby do I have to do this right I love that question so introducing a bottle if if a bottle is something that needs to be part of your infant feeding journey and your breastfeeding relationship because you're returning to employment you're leaving your baby with a caregiver um I would suggest introducing that at about three weeks of age help get your milk, like ride those postpartum hormones, get your milk supply established. And then we can talk about introducing a bottle. Um, and it doesn't have to be a lot. If your baby had even just a couple of bottles a week, starting at week three, that would absolutely be adequate for getting familiar with using this new feeding tool, helping your caregiver get familiar with responding to your baby's cues and doing some baby led bottle feeding um, while not adding to your burden of nursing and pumping and feeding because I feel bad when people waste their maternity leaves attached to a pump Mm. and they fed the freezer instead of feeding the baby Mm. and they missed out a little bit on those first few weeks. Sometimes things happen and some of that is unavoidable. Some of that is maximizing normalcy in a tricky situation. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about when people have looked on the internet too much and have seen (laughs) people's deep freezes 
of 10,000 ounces of human milk stockpiled. And I, my IBCLC eyes see that and grieve a little because I think, oh no, you fed the freezer. Mm. Where is the baby? Yeah, you, There was special time there. So I would say introducing a bottle at about week three, and I'm assuming a six week maternity leave. I know people have different circumstances, but if you have a six week maternity leave and you're offering just a couple of bottles a week during that time, that gives you a chance to get familiar with your pumping gear without having it totally take up and consume your maternity leave and a chance for your baby to get familiar with a different feeding tool as well. I like that. And then do you have to burp your baby? Ask your baby. <laughs> That's what burping is bottle feeding protocol because okay. naturally during a bottle feeding, a ba baby will take in more air than at the breast. When a baby is breastfed, they're not really taking in much air. A well-latched baby is creating a vacuum at the breast mm. and is not taking in a lot of air. And so if a baby nurses happily and then slides off the breast and conks out milk drunk in your lap, that's great. Don't interrupt that with burping nonsense. Yeah. That's not, that's not something to interrupt at all. But if you are bottle feeding your baby and baby finishes and is sleepy but not quite passed out and, and seems restless, then absolutely gentle burping can be part of what you do. And in fact, here, I, brought, I actually brought my little baby friend here to demonstrate something related to burping. There is... Um, for those of you listening, I've got a baby doll over my shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> and this is one of our favorite baby dolls at the office. There is a startle reflex right in between the shoulder blades, and it's common practice to pat vigorously right at the top of the shoulder blades. For very new babies, we're tripping the startle reflex again and again and again. This is the opposite of relaxing for a baby, to be thumped between the shoulder blades. We're like, startle, 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 Which is exactly startle. how I burp my babies. Keep going. And... <laughs> So if we can maintain contact with the baby's back so that we're not tripping that reflex and offer some gentle patting just below or even some gentle rubbing that doesn't remove your hand consistently, it will be a much more soothing experience. And up against your shoulder or even sitting on your lap with your hand in front of baby, we're allowing a little bit of pressure on the front of, on the front of baby so that they can help release any air that, that has gotten stuck in there. I will have you know, I when I started teaching birth classes and I went to a lactation meeting, it was um, a La Leche League meeting. Mm -hmm. You don't know this, but you were the person there. Was I? Yes, you were. <laughs> and that is where I heard you did not have to burp your babies for the very first time. And I stopped burping my baby. And, and it was heaven. Happened? It was heaven. Did it make you feel like you had one less thing to worry about? It really did. Because if they don't burp, then you're like, oh, shoot. <laughs> you know? Right. Dang, Something's what? missing on the checklist. Yeah. We're not really done with the feeding. My favorite part about hearing from someone like an IBCLC, being involved with something like La Leche League with other women who are breastfeeding as well, um, is it makes you feel much more comfortable and confident mm. in just trusting yourself and being a mother. Absolutely. It's my favorite. And so anyways, of course, third baby. That's a huge I part of the Leche League philosophy is that every every mother is the expert on her own baby. And you are absolutely right. And that happens before your baby is born. Right. Hands down. Anyway, so I, I needed that. And I love I'm being glad. able to share that, you know, like all these little things that we hear from generations down, from providers, from this and that. Right. And it's okay to just trust what you're feeling and listen to, to your baby, just like you said. We survive so much. We Mothering is is both universal and extremely isolating. Yes. So whenever <laughs> any of us gets through it, we feel that the way we endured it and managed it and survived and thrived through it is the only way. Mm. And so I think a lot of folk wisdom gets passed on framed as this is the only way. Burping your baby is the way. Yeah. And not necessarily, maybe, maybe your baby really needed it. And that's why you feel that way. Great. Maybe her baby doesn't. Yeah. Maybe her baby is out cold nursing and that's marvelous. We've got surges of oxytocin that make us cozy and sleepy and I th babies nurse mothers to sleep too. Yes, they and absolutely it's, do. It's the same hormone trivia bit here. Um, Oxytocin is the same hormone that is released post-orgasm that makes everybody feel sleepy and cuddly. And, um, and so if your baby is nursing you to sleep and your baby conks out after nursing, that is the biological norm. And any discussion of 
how you're establishing a bad association or a bad habit or this eat, play, sleep stuff. Um, it's fighting biology. Like you're swimming upstream against biology. And for babies that like eat, activity, sleep, I think it's important to reinforce that for babies, eating is an activity. Yeah. So they, if they want to eat and then fall asleep, normal because they had their activity. Yeah. I love it. Thank you. Thank you for doing what you do. I, I love I'm my glad work. you're here. I'm, I'm glad that I had the benefit of meeting you early on, even in my mothering. I just, I'm super glad you get to speak with all these women. It's very powerful. Thank you. Um, okay. I, I did want to touch just a moment before we get off here on some complications because okay. we've talked about a lot of normal, maybe if things kind of happen here and there. Um, but something that we absolutely see a lot of, especially early on, um, is advice about tongue and lip ties. <laughs> oh yeah. Oral restrictions. <laughs> so will you touch on that? And I will tell you, I, as a birth educator and as a doula, I'm part of, you know, several birth groups, mom's groups, those kinds of things. And there's a lot of taking pictures of baby's mouths and is this a tongue tie? Is this a lip tie? And what should I do? Um, I've even had those close to me who have been referred, you know, to a pediatric dentist to have the laser stuff done, um, wondering if that was the right thing. And in this case, the dentist had told them, uh, we don't want baby to be afraid of the dentist, I think, because they're a little bit older. Let's wait. Let's not revise that. Mom wasn't able to breastfeed. I think there's a lot of things around this issue. Right. So I'm just wondering if you can provide us with some wisdom. So everyone has frenula in their mouth um, underneath your upper lip and underneath your tongue if you want to stare at the mirror tonight when you go brush <laughs> your teeth you can see the these pieces of tissue that attach some of our normal oral anatomy having a lingual frenulum underneath the tongue is absolutely a normal part of anatomy it can cause trouble if it is very short and tight or if it extends to further than typical um, and because the tongue is the motor of breastfeeding, we need that tongue to have full mobility. It, it doesn't just need to extend. That's part of it. But it, the tongue needs to be able to extend out of the mouth. It needs to be able to move in a lateral motion to be able to slide back and forth. And I would say perhaps most importantly, it needs to be able to elevate all the way through. The tip of the tongue needs to elevate. The middle of the tongue needs to be able to elevate and that posterior portion of the tongue needs to be able to elevate because the, the way the tongue moves when breastfeeding is in a full peristaltic wave with lots of elevation. If that lingual frenulum is short or tight and compromises any of that elevation or lateralization, then we get a shallow painful latch and poor milk transfer. And I think in our culture, because a lot of breastfeeding pain has been normalized and a lot of pregnant people have been susceptible to, to <laughs> totally uh, victims of horror stories mm -hmm. at their baby showers about how much breastfeeding hurts so much, they, they steal themselves and they brace themselves to endure a lot of pain. And they might endure this too long. If, if breastfeeding pain is lasting more than the first couple of seconds, really, and more than the first few days, it's important to reach out to your IBCLC and see what's going on with that latch. It may be something as simple as adjusting positioning, and it also may be something like um, oral tension, that there's oral restriction there and rest compromised mobility in the mouth. I see all the time, all the time, <laughs> that there are online parenting forums with people asking questions about oral restrictions and breastfeeding or even oral restrictions and bottle feeding too because it compromises all aspects of any kind of infant feeding. Um, and there are referrals and there are lists of so-called preferred providers. Those lists are based on, those are, those are well-meaning parents making those lists. Um, those lists are based on other parents' positive feedback of a good experience in a nice office with pleasant staff. Um, not everyone on a preferred provider list gets my referral hmm. um, because I'm looking at the clinical care that's provided. Um, if, we see, if we see tension in the mouth, we will point it out at, at our practice. IBCLCs do not diagnose. 
but they can thoroughly assess oral mobility, specifically as it relates to infant feeding. And we will point out exactly where we see tension and compromised mobility. We send a report to your pediatrician. Um, if you choose to work with a pediatric dentist, if we see enough tension that it merits a referral to a pediatric dentist, we will send our report. We will collaborate care. We will work with you to help maximize normal feeding, to help prevent missteps. With the online forums, I want people to find information and support. I don't want them to end up driving around to lots of expensive appointments that don't really get to the bottom of the issue. Um, and perhaps, perhaps an, an oral restriction is their perceived issue, but not really what's going on. If you self-refer immediately to a pediatric dentist, mm. you may end up with continued breastfeeding issues and feeding frustrations and now wound care protocol, mm. adding to your burden. It may, not, it may not be the miracle cure you're looking for because you don't have adequate support to troubleshoot. And there are lots of times where while uh, a lip or tongue release procedure might be the next step, a baby's not ready for it. A baby standing on the brink of failure to thrive is not ready for a procedure that compromises feeding for a few days. We don't have mm -hmm. ounces to lose. Uh, we need to focus on chunking up that baby before we even consider anything invasive like that. But I wish that more people would start with their IBCLC. That's what I wish. I'm glad that there's information out there. I'm really glad that there's online support, particularly during the pandemic. I want people to find community and to be able to chat and compare notes. And, and learn about other people's experiences. But for your individual baby, you don't want to be asking the broader internet or even nice mom friends who have their experience with their children. You want to ask a clinician who has seen the work of all the pediatric dentists in your area and knows who, which ones will be able to serve you and your baby best or if it's even merited at all. I love that. Um, I'm wondering, and I appreciate all that. <laughs> I'm wondering, because I know that there is, you know, lip and tongue tie is mm -hmm. one issue. But w when you're talking about latch, colicky babies, lots of spitting up, um, pain for mom, cracked and bleeding nipples, all of this, I That's know a that... a miserable list. Yeah, right? <laughs> Dan, that was just off the top of my head. Uh, but I, I love that you can be that first stop. Mm -hmm. I wonder, does that also include any kind of mental health? Do you ever assess for that? Is that so? In all of in okay. all of our um, consultations, we do a, a rudimentary mental health screening, and we can often see signs when when a new parent is not connecting with their baby at all. Mm. We can see red flags, and so we can talk about that. My very most favorite, because it's so simple, uh, screening assessment that I just think everybody should know about. Every, like. If you have a mother, if you know a mother, if you are a mother, if you have any contact with a postpartum person or a birthing person at all, you should know this. Um, research from Dr. Kathleen Kendall Tackett tells us that insomnia is our number one red flag for postpartum mental health disorders. If it takes you longer than 20 minutes to fall asleep, and I don't mean because you're still scrolling Instagram, I mean like you have an opportunity to sleep. The baby doesn't need you right now and you cannot turn your brain off and you cannot fall asleep within 20 minutes. That 20 minute mark is a red flag for it's time to consult with your doctor and say, I'm having trouble. And that would be, could that be even in those tw first 48 hours? The first 48 hours are, I mean, it could be, absolutely. Although I, I also wanna acknowledge that the first 48 hours are not really even days right. for anyone. <laughs> yes. It's just like a whole pile of hours that all come at you at once. And yes. then and it's kind of like getting the rug pulled out from under you for, for the first two or three days. I'm talking about day four and on. Okay. Day four is notoriously difficult. The euphoria wears off. The exhaustion sets in. And if you know you're tired and all of your support people in your life know that you should be wiped and you're still sitting there wide-eyed because you can't unclench and unworry mm. enough to get a good stretch of sleep, it's time to, to ask questions. It, it may be time to seek medical help. I love that. Before we finish, and I know that we've been talking for a while, but... I love talking about breastfeeding. I know, me too. <laughs> um, were there any other questions that you saw in there that you're like, I want to touch on this or that? 
And I'm just going over questions from my. Yeah, did you want to look over your notes? We've sure covered. I'm I'm skimming okay. them. Um, I mean, oh, there's like specific. Here's questions a really here, good one. Okay. This is actually a really a really excellent question that someone asked. Um, the question was, can you successfully breastfeed and pump so that your husband or partner can feed the baby too? My answer is yes. You can do that, but acknowledge that you are bending biology a little bit and creating a slightly different workload for yourself. Because whenever somebody else feeds the baby in a different way from nursing, that kind of obligates you to go remove milk with a pumping mm -hmm. session. And maybe you're totally willing to do that, and maybe you're doing that anyway because you're at work or at school, and so that's just a logical part of your breastfeeding journey. But if it isn't, just acknowledge that I can do that, but I'm also creating an extra chore for myself. And with that, I would like to point out too that there are so many ways for dads and partners to help that don't necessarily involve feeding the baby. Babies are a great big project. Babies need to be bathed and dressed and walked around with and sung to. And there's so many things to do with babies that don't necessarily mean feeding them. That is not the only thing that your partner can do with a baby. And there, and he will not feel left out. <laughs> we, can, we can include him in so many ways, particularly in taking care of the postpartum parent. Yeah. That's mothering the mother is the partner's job. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, probably something I could, that would be like a whole session on its own, right? Totally. Yeah. Um, I want everyone to know where they can find you. And okay. I actually have kind of one more question before you go, mm -hmm. um, because we had talked about this just a touch too before we jumped on here. And that was what stops women from getting help when they do know that IBCLCs exist? Right. I think, well, often I think it's exactly that, that they don't know who to talk sure. to. Or they may go straight back to the hospital. And again, hospital IBCLCs might be awesome, but they also might be very, very busy with an enormous caseload um, of their, of their in-hospital patients. Yeah. Um, and they also might be limited somewhat in their scope of what they see in that maybe they are really excellent with establishing lactation for um, families with a baby in the NICU, or they're really excellent at establishing breastfeeding for immediately postpartum parents with brand newborns. But three weeks in, maybe they just don't see a lot of three-week-olds or four-month-olds or two-year-olds. Maybe they just don't see that very much. And so maybe that's not your best resource. That's why um, a private practice lactation consultant is not beholden to anyone but you. Mm. And maybe she has deliberately distanced herself from a healthcare system so that she can have some freedom and autonomy to provide her clients with the very best care. Um, I think also a huge stumbling block for lots of people in why they don't seek IBCLC care is cost. And I want to be absolutely respectful about that. And I'm not trying to spend money casually from other people's wallets, but I think it's a worthy investment. And if you can find your budget and set your budget for beautiful newborn photography and a doula and a cute new tattoo that represents your baby <laughs> or anything else as you've prepared to welcome your baby and enjoy your baby and this new person in your life budgeting for IBCLC care should be on your list because it will help you enjoy your baby and will prevent expensive missteps in the long run yeah if you hit trouble I think that's probably the biggest thing and I noticed the same thing being a childbirth educator, right? You can spend the couple hundred dollars on getting some good education so that you're aware of what's happening on your way in. Or you can come back to me the next time after you've had a really rough shot right. at this. And some things that you look back and said, oh, I could have prevented it by doing this, this, and this, and I wouldn't have right. had to hire all these different things out. So I, I would say totally absolutely 90% of the questions that I see posted online to breastfeeding forums, but particularly tongue tie forums mm -hmm. could and should be answered by that original posters, IBCLC, yeah. who should be shepherding them through the process. And if they had an IBCLC instead of just Google, they would yeah. have much more focused care that answered their specific questions and met their specific needs. 
I love it. Okay, so with that and all of your knowledge and the joy of having you here, I want everyone to know how to reach out to you. So okay. social media handles, websites, where you work, how they get in touch with you. Okay. Are you still doing online appointments so they don't have to be here in Utah? What does that we look do like? offer virtual care okay. and in fact the pandemic made us get really good at virtual care awesome so that allows us to serve far away clients and um and and people for who just can't come into salt lake um our office is beautiful and cozy and comfortable and has free easy parking right outside the door which i always hype up because before this was our office location I always had parking anxiety in Salt Lake, um, <laughs> yes, but that's, that's real. <laughs> but that's not that's not needed. Um, our location has been deliberately chosen to avoid that stress. Um, you can find us. Our website is www.motherfed.net, and most questions can be answered there. There's um, you can see detailed bios of the four IBCLCs at Motherfed, um, and information about pricing and what we provide. Um, we're also on Instagram. You should totally follow our Instagram. Our Instagram is beautiful. My, my colleague Susan um, curates the entire internet to make our Instagram beautiful. And it's, it's an excellent combination of useful tidbits for enjoying your baby and helping your baby and enjoying infant feeding and also just beautiful breastfeeding art and other things like that. I would highly recommend following us at Motherfed on Instagram. Um, we're also Motherfed on Facebook, and we have a Pinterest. Remember Pinterest? Um, you forget. I forget about Pinterest. We <laughs> have we have a, a a Pinterest compiled of all kinds of useful information and helpful hacks and things. Um, our Pinterest is impressive. Um, every time I look at it, I'm like, "This is cool. I forgot about this one." Um, and yeah. is that at Motherfed on Pinterest as yes, well? Yes, okay. absolutely. Yep, awesome. at Motherfed. Um, so yeah, people can find us at all of those places. Our contact information is on our website. If you call and leave a message, we'll get right back to you to help you schedule all kinds of options. We, with four IBCLCs, we can usually get someone in within 24 to 48 hours. Um, and our, a consultation always includes some phone support and tech support. We don't want to send people just out the door and say, good luck with that. We want to, we're interested. We're invested too and making sure people get what they need to enjoy their babies and enjoy their nursing journey. Great. Well, thank you so much for being here with me. My I, pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I can't wait for this to go live and for everyone to learn a little bit more about IBCLCs, but I know that this is just a conversation you're going to get to replay over and over again. So appreciate your time. Great. Thank you so much. That's it for this week, but make sure you subscribe to the podcast so that you get notifications first as I drop new episode every week. And don't forget to head over to myessentialbirth.com for all of the free downloads mentioned here and to join the birth course and community serving pregnant moms just like you. If you enjoyed this and other episodes, I would love it if you would take a few minutes to leave a review on Apple Podcasts. I read every single one and include one at the beginning of each episode. See you next week.